Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you're here. I'm here. I'm glad to be here, too. We're, we're excited about today. I have some good news and I have some bad news for you today. The bad news is that our world is full of bad news these days. The good news is that our world has always been full of bad news, and bad news never really prevails. One of the worst moments in our nation's history happened, no, no, no not on Tuesday, um, on, on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese Navy attacked the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor, killing 2,400 Americans and disabling most of our battleships on that day. That was a day of bad news. But the good news was that three aircraft carriers were out on maneuvers at the time, and so our carrier fleet was intact. And six months later, the carrier group destroyed four Japanese carriers in the Battle of Midway, and ultimately, we won the war. We remembered this. This week, we celebrate Veterans Day, and we remember all of those who have served in the military, the men and women of our armed services who have made history over the years. So I want to give all of our veterans a chance to stand up today and be recognized. So if you've served in the Army, go ahead and stand up. Army. Okay. If you served in the Navy, go ahead and stand up. Thank you. If you served in the Air Force, go ahead and stand up. I'm just kidding. Um, if you served in the Coast Guard, go ahead and stand up. And if you were in the Marine Corps, go ahead and stand up. All right, let's give a hand for all of our veterans today. Our military vets have been a part of history. They've seen bad news and they've seen good news. History is like that, right? Wait long enough and the good news always triumphs over the bad. Let me give you an example. On Good Friday, our Savior died. That was the worst news in history. But three days later, he rose from the dead. That was the best news in history. And on top of that, he ascended to the right hand of our Father in heaven. He sent his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And he launched the church. Bad news is always with us. But bad news is always followed by good news because the forces of good in this universe are stronger than the forces of evil. Amen? Ezra, we've been talking about and looking through uh, the Chronicles, which Ezra wrote. He was a scribe. And he knew that his people were emerging from a national crisis and they needed some good news. They needed some hope. They needed some inspiration. They needed reminders that their great God works all things together for the good of those who love him. So Ezra writes stories. He writes real-life stories with real-life lessons. And one of those stories is, is really a, a bad news to good news kind of story that involves mayhem and murder, and, and it spans over three generations. And we're going to take a look at that today. And during, this, during the worst moment of this crisis... For seven years, the people had no hope. We've been wrestling with, with problems of hope now for several months. But Ezra's people wrestled with no hope for decades. How did they cope? How did God rescue them? Well, that's the story I'm going to tell you today. Are you ready to do some learning? Yeah. Good. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, speak to me. Amen. Come on, everybody. Lord Jesus, speak to me. 
Amen. Okay, throughout this series, I've been asking if you brought your Bibles with you, and some of you have, or if you don't have it, that's fine. Open the Bible app on your phone. We're going to be bouncing around in in Chronicles today, but we're going to start in 1 Chronicles in chapter 17, and that takes place during the reign of King David. One day, God says to David, starting from the time I appointed judges to rule my people, I will defeat all of your enemies. Furthermore, I declare that the Lord will build a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and join your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, one of your sons, and make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for me, and I will secure his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son, and I will never take my favor away from him as I took it from the one who ruled before you. I will confirm him as king over my house and my kingdom for all time, and his throne will be secure forever. So there's two promises in this passage that I really want to highlight to you. One is there would always be a descendant of David ruling over the nation of Israel. And second, that one of those descendants would rule over God's kingdom forever. In other words, the Messiah, the forever ruler, would be a descendant of King David. Now, throughout the Old Testament, there were prophecies that one day a Messiah would come. But from this day in chapter 17 of 1 Chronicles onward, everyone knew that that Messiah, when he came, would be a descendant of King David. The Israelites knew this. And Satan knew this. Satan is not all-knowing, but he is exceedingly crafty and creative. And, And when this prophecy was given, it clued him in that the Messiah must come from the lineage of David. So Satan knows that that God must be true to his word. He knows that if he can extinguish the line of David, he can prevent the Messiah from coming and saving mankind from our sins. That's how Satan thinks. And so in 841 BC, Satan sees and seizes a strategic opportunity to eliminate the line of David. Here's how this happened. First, a little history. As we already talked about, God promised that David will never lack an heir for the throne of Israel, and two, that God promises that an heir of David will rule God's kingdom forever. So the Messiah would come from the line of David. Now we're going to fast forward 150 years to the time of King Jehoshaphat, whom we've been, who we studied last week, right? During the course of his reign, Jehoshaphat made what seemed to him to be an expedient decision to secure an alliance with his greatest threat, the enemy, the kingdom to the north, Israel. Now, back in those days, it was common to seal alliances for two kings to marry their children to each other. So in this case, Jehoshaphat married his son Jehoram to the king of Israel's daughter, who was named Athaliah. Now, follow me. This is going to be some family dynamics going on here. It's going to take a minute to, to lay this all out for you, okay? But as we do, we're going to learn an important lesson that could save some of you a lot of stress in your families if you pay attention and, and take on the lessons. Okay, so if you've got a map in the back of your Bible, now's the time to turn to it. If you don't have one, there's one on the screen. The map of Israel is, is such that uh, the, the nation of Israel sit, sits at the eastern edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And at this time in history, Israel is divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom is simply called Israel, and the southern kingdom is called Judah. The northern kingdom was ruled by a king named Ahab, and the southern kingdom was ruled by Jehoshaphat, which we already know. Ahab, in order to secure his northern border, he had married the daughter of the king of the north. That kingdom was called Sidon, and the king's name at that time was Ethbaal. Now, we're going to break down that name. Eth, Eth means with. And can you guess what the name Baal means? It means Baal, right? Baal was the fertility god of the Canaanites. So Eth Baal literally means with Baal. He was a worshiper of Baal. Eth Baal had a daughter. Her name was Jezebel. Now we're getting to some familiar stuff, right? 
Now, you may have heard of her before. She is infamous for worshiping Baal and corrupting pretty much all of Israel during the time that she was queen. Ahab married Jezebel. Together, they had a daughter that they named Athaliah. Meanwhile, Jehoshaphat and his wife had a son that they named Joram. To cement their alliance, Ahab and Jehoshaphat married their two children to each other. That meant that the wife of the crown prince of Judah was not a follower of God in heaven, but a follower of Baal. And you know what? Everything went along fine until the day that Jehoshaphat died. On that day, Jehoram became the king and Athaliah became the queen. Now you would like and we'd hope that the story said at that point that everyone lived happily ever after, but, but we know that the world is full of bad news and that happily ever afters are usually only, only follow ha- not so happy disasters, right? And so Jehoram's first act as king was to do what no Israelite king had ever done, but what almost every pagan king in places like Sidon usually did, and that was he killed all of his brothers so that none of them could threaten his throne. So if you're taking notes, (laughs) to form an alliance, Ahab, the king of Israel, married Jezebel, the princess of Sidon. This happens about 40 years before our story begins. And then during the next generation, in order to form an alliance, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, married his son Jehoram to Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah. You with me? So 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 1 says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in great abundance, and he made an alliance with Ahab through marriage. That seems innocent enough, right? It might even have been a smart thing to do, right? Make an alliance with your enemy and then they become your ally. This happens 20 years before our story begins. Let's call this the the law of unforeseen consequences. If you marry somebody who's potentially dangerous, you might not foresee this, but something dangerous is probably about to happen to you. So here is the introduction of our story. 2 Chronicles 21, verse 1. When Jehoshaphat died, he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David, and um, then his son Jehoram became the next king. Jehoram's brothers, the sons of of Jehoshaphat, were Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azarihu, Michael, and Shephatiah, and all of these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Their father had given them each valuable gifts of silver, gold, and costly items, and also some of Judah's fortified towns. However, he designated Jehoram as the next king because he was the oldest. But when Jehoram had become solidly established as king, he killed all of his brothers and some of the other leaders of Judah. When Jehoram became king, he killed all his brothers. He eliminated the competition. And suddenly, all of the descendants of David... Out of all of them, there was only one direct descendant, and that's Jehoram, along with all of the sons that he will give birth to over time, right? Well, later that very same year, in 841 B.C., Jehoram died in a battle. Ezra's comment in verse 20 is pretty telling. He says, he died to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tomb of the kings, because he did not merit a kingly tomb. Often, when a king dies, the kingdom is vulnerable because the neighboring nations know that the new king is going to be young and inexperienced, and so that's the time that they choose to attack. And the attack happens, and Judah is invaded by their neighbors. And they carried off all of the possessions found in the king's palace, and also all of the sons and wives. Not a son was left to him except Ahaziah, his youngest son. So the Philistines, these raiders, they came in and they killed one of Jehoram, they killed all but one of Jehoram's sons, Ahaziah, the youngest one. And then there was one, right? And here's where our story really begins. I know I've been building for there a while, but that's, it's, this is where we start. The kingdom and the whole messianic line are hanging by a single thread, Ahaziah. And so 2 Chronicles 22 opens with, the people of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, Jehoram's youngest son, their next king. Since the marauding bands who had come with the Arabs had killed all of the older sons. So Ahaziah, son of Jehoram, 
reigned as king of Judah. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he became the king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for one year. His mother was Athaliah, a granddaughter of King Omri. Now, if you know what is coming, you can almost hear the, down, the downbeats of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony right now, right? Dun, 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 dun. Because just a few months after his coronation, Ahaziah is killed in a battle. No problem, right? No problem. Ahaziah had sons and nephews all over the palace. But they're all young and powerless. The person closest to power was the dowager queen Athaliah, the widow of King Jehoram. And she is now holding power. She is not Jewish. She is the daughter of Jezebel. She does not worship our Lord and Savior. She worships Baal. This is Satan's moment. This is when Satan launches his strategic initiative. When Athaliah, the mother of King Isaiah of Judah, learned that her son was dead, she began to destroy the rest of the royal family. When Ahaziah died, Athaliah killed all of the royal heirs. The king is dead. His descendants are dead. The Davidic line is dead. And with it, all of the hopes for a Messiah go with it. This, friends, is the Good Friday of the Old Testament. Baal has triumphed. Satan is one. This is the bad news. If this was a Star Wars movie, someone somewhere right about now would be saying, I have a bad feeling about this. All was dark. All hope was lost. For seven years, Judah lived under the rulership of a foreign queen who worshipped a foreign god. She was the COVID-19 of her day. If you've lost your job, you know how they felt. If you're depressed or if you're frustrated, if you're, if you're irritated, if you're angry, you know how these people feel. The person in charge of their state, their nation, had driven a stake through the heart of all of their hopes. But remember what follows bad news. Did you know? Did you know that God is really good in situations like this? Let's see how the story unfolds. When Athaliah, the mother of King Isaiah of Judah, learned that her son was dead, she began to destroy the rest of Judah's royal army. That's verse 10. We already read that, but I wanted to bring us back into focus. Look at what comes next in verse 11. But Isaiah's sister, Jehosheba, the daughter of King Jehoram, took Isaiah's infant son, Joash, and stole him away from among the rest of the king's children who were about to be killed. She put Joash and his nurse in a bedroom, and in this way, Jehosheba, the wife of Jehodiah the priest and sister of Isaiah, hid the child so that Athaliah could not murder him. Joash remained hidden in the temple of God for six years while Athaliah ruled over the land. But then, in the seventh year of Athaliah's reign, Jehodiah, the priest, decided to act. And he summoned his courage and made a pact with five army commanders. Azariah, son of Jehoram, Ishmael, son of Jehonanan, Azariah, son of Obed, Maashiah, son of Adiah, and Elashaphat, the son of Zikri. These men traveled secretly throughout Judah and summoned the Levites and the clan leaders in all of the towns, and they came to Jerusalem. And then in verse 3, which we should have, yeah. They all gathered at the temple of God where they made a solemn pact with Joash, the young king. Jehodiah said to them, here is the king's son. Now drop down to verse 12. When Athaliah heard all of the noise of the people running and the shouts of praise to the new king, she hurried to the Lord's temple to see what was happening. When she arrived, she saw a newly crowned king standing in the place of authority by the pillar at the temple entrance, and the commanders and the trumpeters were surrounding him, and the people all over the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Singers with musical instruments were leading people in this great celebration. When Athalia saw all of this, she tore her clothes and shouted, Treason! Treason! Then Jehodiah, the priest, ordered the commanders who were in charge of the troops. He said, take her to the soldiers in front of the temple and kill anyone who tries to rescue her. For the priest said, she must not be killed in the temple of the Lord. So they seized her 
and they led her out to the entrance of the horse gate to the palace grounds, and they killed her there. Triumph, right? The forces of darkness had seemed to be in control. It seemed like Satan had won. Good was defeated. Evil had overcome. But what seems and what is are not always the same thing. Friends, the God of the Bible is the God of good news. He's the God of the rescue. He's the God of the second chance. He's the God of the comeback. With him, there's always a way out of the darkness. Dreams of a Messiah were dead. And then there was a resurrection. Sorrow may remain for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Sorrow may remain for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen? Athalia had annihilated all of the royal heirs, but seven years later it was discovered that one heir survived. Talk about rejoicing. Then Jehodiah made a covenant between himself and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's people and that all of the people went to the temple of Baal and they tore it all down. They demolished the altars and they smashed the idols and they, they killed Matan the priest of Baal in front of the altars. Jehodiah then put the priests and the Levites in charge of the temple of the Lord again and following all the directions that had been given by David. He also commanded them to present burnt offerings to the Lord as prescribed in the law of Moses and to sing and rejoice as David had instructed them to. He also stationed gatekeepers at the gates of the Lord's temple to keep out any of those who might be ceremonially unclean. Then the commanders and the nobles and the rulers and all of the people of the land escorted the young king from the temple of the Lord and they went through the upper gate and into the palace and they seated him on the royal throne. And so all of the people of the land rejoiced and the city was peaceful because Athalia had been killed. That's the story. Ezra is recounting Israel's history so that we can learn lessons that can be applied during our time in history. Ezra is letting us know that there is a war going on in heaven that is playing out on earth. And that this war is more real than the war in Afghanistan, more real than the war in Iraq or Kuwait or Vietnam or Korea, or even more real than World War II. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says this, We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That might explain why you're feeling the way that you are feeling these days. What you're feeling isn't just about a virus or injustice or a quarantine or about being shut in or even your feelings about this election. Something deeper is going on in our world every day. Ephesians chapter 6, 12 that we just read is followed by Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, which says, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in time of evil. The armor of God is faith and hope and righteousness and truth of salvation and God's word and the Holy Spirit. Stand firm in those things, friends. Stand firm. Trust God and believe what he says that he will do, and he will do what he says he's going to do. Ezra is teaching us that God, God always has plans, and his plans are to build us up, not to tear us down. And he's also teaching us that Satan always has plans, and, and Satan's plans are always to tear us down and never to build us up. And so Ezra is teaching us that God always wins. Amen? The Athalias of our world may rule for a while, but never forever. And weeping may remain for the night, but joy comes in the morning, and the morning is coming. Say that with me. The morning is coming. No, say that like you mean it. The morning is coming. Very good. That's our vertical lesson today that explains the spiritual dimension of our condition and why it always seems so much worse than it really is. But on the horizontal plane, Ezra's teaching us a lesson there too. And that lesson is success is determined by the company that you keep. Let's not miss that lesson. Jehoshaphat endangered generations that followed by building an alliance with a Baal worshiper. 
He didn't know he was doing it. It seemed innocent to him at the time, maybe even like a good idea. But this is maybe why God spells this out so clearly for us in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, don't team up, don't be yoked with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be partnered with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? And how can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. So on a practical level, Ezra is teaching us, be careful who you marry. You don't just marry a body. You marry a mind. You marry their beliefs and value system. And you don't just marry a person either. You marry their family too, right? When Jehoram got Athaliah, he also got Jezebel and all her Baal-worshipping priests and courtiers and all of the evil that went with them. Ezra is also encouraging us to line up all of our partnerships with believers, with people who share our values. He also encourages us to always have a mentor. The story of young King Joash is a story of mentorship. You see, the young King Joash, he did well and he walked with the Lord as long as he had that priest, Jehodiah, with him. But the story kind of ends in chapter 24, verse 15. Jehodiah lived to a very old age the priest, finally dying at 130 years old. He was buried among the kings in the city of David because he had done so much good in Israel for God and his temple. But it doesn't stop there, right? After Jehodiah's death, the leaders of Judah came and bowed before King Joash and persuaded him to listen to their advice. They decided to abandon the temple of the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and they worshipped Asherah poles and idols instead. And because of this sin, divine anger fell upon Judah and Jerusalem for many years. Jehoshaphat had made an alliance, and as a result of that alliance, the lineage of David and the promise of the Messiah were almost wiped out. And so we're going to close with this. Satan is always working to defeat God's plans, but he never succeeds. And the story of Joash is a story of triumph from ashes, a story of revival. It's also a story of two unsung heroes who were not kings. One was a rescuer named Jehosheba, and the other was a mentor named Jehodiah. They happened to be married to each other because at different times in our lives, we need a rescuer. And everyone needs a mentor all the time. And this is a story of the war in heaven. And it's a story of relationships on earth. And the moral of this story is that God always wins. So stay close to him and you will win too. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. If you are a Christian today, and I hope that you are, you will affirm your wholehearted commitment to the Lord by saying, Lord, all I am is yours. And all I have is yours. And if you're not a Christian, I hope you give your life to the Lord today by saying, Lord, all I am is yours, and all I have is yours. Pray with me today. Lord, today we are lying down every alliance in our lives that would keep us from being fully devoted to you. We lay down that thing whether it's a habit, a hurt, a hang-up, an addiction, a relationship, a false belief, whatever it is, Lord, that keeps us from closeness to you, we're laying that down. And then right now, friends, would you just pray this simple prayer out loud with me? Lord, all I am is yours. All I have is yours. Here we go. Lord, all I am is yours. All I have is yours. Amen.